Children are dismissed. If you came in late, um, if you want your child to go to the family camp, sign up over there on the side. Amen. We're going to be in, uh, in the book of Revelation tonight. We've been in the book of Revelation. We're about to finish this, this book up. I don't know. I started, I, I ventured down the New Testament path probably about three years ago, I guess. We were teaching in the Old Testament. We were getting ready to go to First Chronicles. And we shifted gears and we went into the New Testament. And here we're about to end the New Testament. We've been doing a lot of end times teaching. You know, real quick, just so that we're kind of like on the same page. The word, the word revelation, it, it, the, the idea is that something is being revealed. And what's being revealed, the name of the book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So the idea is that there's been a sheet or a covering that has covered the work and the person and the ministry of Jesus. And that in the end, it's all going to be removed and there's not going to be any more confusion and that Jesus is going, to, is going to be revealed. And so when we get to the end of the book, the interesting thing about the Bible, because I've tried to study, uh, not, not in detail, but I've tried to learn other religions so that I can talk to people about their religion and their beliefs so that I can introduce Jesus uh, into the conversation because I know that Jesus is the answer, amen? I've seen what he's done in my heart and in my life, and I've seen w- the way that he's taken you know, me down this journey, and, and I see the truth and the validity in God's word, and the better I understand God's word, the better I feel as though I'm learning about God, and uh, you know, I just want other people to be able to know God and to, and to be introduced to him so that they can also grow in, uh, in their relationship with God. So the idea, if you go back all the way to the beginning, I know the first time like, I ever spoke to Sean Pereira about the Bible, I preached to him from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, you know, in the end, he asked me to pray with him. I'm not going to try to do that, but I do, wa- I do want to say something real quick about, you know, in the beginning, we hear the stories of how the earth was created. And we realize in creation that God was very purposeful and that what he did was he created an earth that would uh, uh, supply what man needed. I mean, and what I'm just saying, I'm not trying to get too technical on you, but God created, you know, he created sun first. He created water, you know, before he created grass and, you know, and before he created the animals, he had created grass. And we understand from simple elementary science that in order for, for photo photosynthesis to take place. We got to have sunlight. We got to have water. And all of these things have to take place. And for animal life to be able to, to, be able to live, right, you got to be able to have all of these things. And so we realize now, based on the Bible, that, that God's plan, what's going on? Just keep, keep going? Okay. Praise God. Good. Uh, we realize that God's plan is that the earth would um, would be able to uh, house mankind, amen. And then we see how the enemy came in, right? The enemy came in, and he he his plan was to bring destruction and to bring division and to bring mankind away from God, right? And he brought sin into the human race, and that sin now has really influenced and in, I mean, some people don't like to hear the, that word infected the entirety of the human race. And the whole Bible story tells us about how mankind has been blinded towards God, towards God's love, and that sin has caused uh, mankind uh, to be blinded from God's love and from God's, uh, you know, from God's will, amen? But then we hear the story of Jesus, amen? The beautiful story of Jesus and how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that uh, whenever Jesus uh, would go to the cross and willingly die for the sins of humanity. And, uh, and that's the first step in understanding the Bible and understanding our relationship with God is that, is that God sent Jesus to die for our sin and that to understand that it's sin that separates us from the presence of God. And really and truly it's sin that prevents us from being able to see the Lord. Lord for the way that he is. And if we're talking about revelation and Jesus being revealed, a big part of that in our life today is that sin will will conceal the, what God really looks like. And he wants us to know Jesus. Amen. So now the next step in this little bit of a journey for tonight is to understand that when God sent Jesus and then Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of our 
sin, then the, 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 the question has to be asked is, when you hear the story of Jesus, that's the good news of the gospel. When somebody tells you the story about Jesus and how he died to pay the penalty of your sin, when your heart hears that, you either believe it in your mind or you don't and you reject it immediately. Sometimes that seed is planted and then as time goes on, another seed is planted and a seed is watered. And that at some point in time, you have the opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when, when, you got it, when you're going to get saved, all I can tell you is, is that it's got to be a heart thing. Amen. You know, I'm not really trying to be negative. I don't want to be negative. I really don't. But I got to tell you that for the longest time, people have tried to teach that all you got to do is raise your hand in the church. Or if somebody says, you know, say a prayer, you, you, just, you just raise your hand in the church or you just repeat a prayer after me. But I got to tell you that to be saved, you have to believe in your heart. What does that even mean? Right? I'm telling you, first, you got to be able to believe in your head. Because if you don't even know about Jesus and you don't understand that he died on the cross for your sin, if you don't know you're a sinner, I know I've already said sin, what, about 30 times? Y'all keep count. If you, if you don't even know that you're a sinner, you can't get saved. So we sit in churches all across America now, and they won't even say the word sin one time because they're concerned that they're going to offend you and that you're going to get up and you're going to walk out. And just like I sat in that church in Berwick so long ago, and that preacher kept talking about the blood. She talked about sin, and she talked about the blood. She talked about sin, and she talked about the blood. And the more she said blood, the more uncomfortable I got. And I can tell you right now, well, she wasn't the problem. I got to tell you, the problem was, was me, I was full of sin, and I was about to get saved, and there was demonic presence that was trying to frustrate me and cause me to get up and to walk out. Now, I got to warn you that even after you give your heart to the Lord, that the enemy is not going to give up on you. The enemy wants your soul. And he's going to try to frustrate you. And he's going to try to make you think church is stupid. And he's going to try to make you think Christianity is stupid. He's going to try to make you think Christian music is stupid. And all these other kinds of things. He's going to whisper all kinds of lies to you. And that's the, that's the forces of evil trying to prevent people from truly being saved. But I got to tell you something. That when you do believe with your heart. And you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth. I'm telling you when the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. You're going to know something has changed and something has happened because the word of God says in Ephesians 1.13 that when you receive that gospel, that gospel story, when somebody told you the truth and you received it by faith, that you receive a down payment of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, you will never be the same, my friend. Does that mean that you're never going to struggle again? No. And that opens up a book for another time. But I will tell you this, Jesus didn't just die so that you could be saved. He also died so that you could be free. God, Jesus died so that you and I could have authority over the works of darkness. Jesus died so that others could be free. Amen. And I just want to encourage you with that tonight. When we get into the book of Revelation, and specifically chapter 20 tonight, what we're going to see is that in the end, God's bringing it all back together. That his purpose and his plan for man was that he would have an eternal family. That he would establish his kingdom upon the earth. Amen. God has already begun to establish his kingdom on the earth. It's a long story, but he called a man named Abraham out of Iraq before there ever was a nation called Israel. And through that man, he gave him many sons. And, and one of his offspring's name was Jacob, and his name was changed to Israel. And J Israel had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And there became a nation known as Israel, which we can still hear about them today. And I got good news for you that through Israel, God gave us Jesus, and that now in Christ, there's a whole group of people. Listen, this is not some fairy tale, my friend. This book is telling us the truth about a God who created mankind, created this earth, and wants to have a relationship with us. He loves you so much. And, you know, I know y'all probably thinking, you know, why would he love you? Just a loud mouth preacher. I don't even understand why. I don't know why he loves me either, but I know he does. And if he can love a wretch like me, I know he can love you, my friend. <laughs> he can love you. I'm telling you, he wants to love you. He does love you. And he wants you to love him. Amen. And he wants you to be part of his family. I'm telling you right now, this is just, we're about to, look, look, well, I say we're about to. I don't know when. One day God is going to turn a page. And when he turns that page, it's going to be a whole different, it's going to be a whole different story, line to the story. 
This human life that we now know, do you believe that? Because listen, if you don't believe that, you walked in the wrong door. I'm just going to be honest with you. They got a lot of churches out there that are going to give you a pep talk, and, they're gonna, and I'm not fussing about them. If that's what, pe- if that's, listen, they got a lot of churches out there that are going to give you a pep talk, and they're going to try to talk to you about how you can have your best life now, okay? And can I tell you a story? God will give you an awesome life now. He, he, the, the Word of God says that the joy of the Lord it can be your strength, amen, that the grace of the Lord flowing in your life can heal you, set you free, and, 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 and give you strength and encourage you to walk a life where you can be lived for something bigger than yourself where you can be a witness for the Lord, where God will use you in other people's lives and give you hope. Amen. And I got to tell you that God wants to do that in your heart and in your life. But he wants you to know him because this is a temporary state of mind. Have you ever thought about that before? I mean, I'm not trying to challenge you so hard when you come through the doors, but I know how many times I've driven down the road and the sky is blue and the clouds are fluffy. And I think to myself, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life than this than just waking up and being a robot and just going mindlessly through each and every day. Get up again, right, and do it all over again. No, I got to tell you, there's more to this life. And one day the page is going to be turned and then we enter eternity, my friend. And the question for each and every human being is, did we receive the Lord? Did we become a child of God? The Bible says in John chapter 1, That anyone who would believe him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Amen. Are you a son of God tonight? I just want you to know that there's a loving father in heaven that gave his only begotten son so that you could have hope in life. Amen. And now when we get to chapter 20 again, we see that if if you had been with us through the whole book of Revelation, what you would begin to realize is that... Uh, the whole book of Revelation is telling the story or reminding us how through all these ages and all these years, the enemy has been trying to fight against God and against God's plan and trying to steal God's plan for this earth and trying to steal God's people from him. And that there's coming a day when judgment will fall upon wickedness and evil and that God will allow his kingdom to take place on this earth. I know that's a lot of information, but I'm here to tell you that the Bible says that Jesus will one day rule and reign physically on this earth. I don't know if that, I don't know if that, are we just going to just say that and just act like we didn't just say something? The Bible says that Jesus will one day physically rule and reign on this earth, and I believe that. Amen? All right. Let's read. Let's read some of this. Uh, so we're in the Strong's, uh, the strong, uh, the, I'm sorry, the King James Version with the Strong's right here. And I'm going to kind of switch back and forth a little bit. But in this first verse, I, I want, and I'm going to get kind of deep into a couple of little things uh, tonight. But uh, there's a purpose for it because I think moving forward, especially in our little class that we're going to have all in the off week, some of this uh, idea may come up. But y'all just bear with me because I'm going to try to explain it when I get kind of like a little bit deep, okay? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Let's just go ahead and read a little bit more. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Boy, there's a lot there, really, if you start trying to break it down. So let's just go real quick right here because I want to I show you something. So these are just the basic concepts that take place in this chapter. Satan is bound. We're about to, we, just, we just read a little bit about that. For, for a short period of time, Satan will be freed for a moment, okay? And then he will ultimately be doomed. Okay, and then ultimately at the end of this chapter, we hear about the judgment that takes place at the throne of God. All right, so what this right here, you may not even be able to read it in the back, but in the King James Version, I want, I want to bring you back over here to verse 2. 
In the King James Version, it says that he laid hold of that dragon and he bound Satan and bound him a thousand years. And where did he put him? He put him in the bottomless pit. But I want you to see this translation of the Bible right here in the NASB because I'm trying to make a point to you. I'm, I'm, it, it's a kind of a technical point, but, I, but it, to me it has purpose. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss. You know the di- notice the difference? Bottomless pit versus abyss. The, so there it is again. Revelation 20 verse 1, the angel angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Now, what is my purpose in even talking about that? I want to talk to you a little bit because listen, sometimes people start to get their Greek, their Strong's Greek concordance and they start looking words up and sometimes they 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 come to a conclusion and they don't understand exactly what it is that they're finding and what they're seeing. And this is just using this as an example because I hope that as we move forward in our off night Bible study, by the way, this Sunday is, is Father's Day. And uh, some of y'all may not be able to make it, but there's a couple of people that still want to go to the off night Bible study. So can, real quick, can I get a little show of hands if you want to go? If you don't want to go, just be honest. Okay. All right, yeah, we got enough along with the uh, other person that wants to come, so we'll, we'll do it. All right, good deal. All right, so this is what I want you to see here. Now, this Greek, you see this word? This is actually a word in the Greek right there. Now, don't get all stressed out on me now because, look, transliteration versus translation. Oh, my God, my brain just shut down. It used a big word. No, don't freak out because you don't even have to know what those words mean. I'm about to explain something to you. And for some of y'all, don't be overwhelmed with too much information because this stuff is not really that important to, to, to what the rest of what we're going to talk about. This is more for like people that are coming to the little off night class when we're going to be digging deep and we want to look at some other things and we want to learn Bible study techniques to understand things better. Okay. So that Greek word right there and it, 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 off to the side is abusas. That's how you would say that. Abusas. Right there. It doesn't look like it, but that's what it says. Because you see, it's, a, it's alpha, beta, upsilon, sigma, sigma, omicron, sigma. Okay? Obusas. And so what I want you to understand is that a transliteration of a word is when you take an English letter and you apply it to a Greek letter. And you just, so the first word is, letter is alpha. In the English language, that would be A. The second letter is beta. The English letter would be B. The, the third, that's a tricky one because there's not a Y in Greek. That, that's upsilon, and you can translate that as Y. That's why the word suke for soul in English is psyche, and connected to the soul is the mind of the human being, all right? So abusos is A-B-U-S-S-O-S. So here we go. Look, A, B, Y, S, S. So that's a transliteration. That's when you take one letter from one language and you take another letter and you bring it and you make a word in English off of a Greek word. What's the difference between that and a translation? That does not tell us what an abyss is. So whenever we look at what the King James Version says, this is just making a point. I'm about to move on, so don't fall asleep on me. The bottomless pit. That's actually a better translation that, that, not, not that abyss is bad, but it kind of tells us what it means. That's the difference. A translation is supposed to give you the understanding of what it means versus a transliteration just gives you a word that looks the same in the original language. Okay, I want y'all, I want y'all to understand that. All right, so, so now we're moving forward. All right, so look, in Revelation 20 verse 2, I want you to see this. It says, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I wanted to point something out to you. And I apologize for the side note for our off week Bible study class, but we had one major thing that we all were kind of like dealing with on that night. And it had to do with the word Satan. Y'all remember that? How beautiful of a thing that we just happened to be going to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, because like one of the things that Sean was saying, who better to refocus the camera for us than Jesus? Meaning, sometimes we don't have clear understanding of something in the Old Testament, but then when we get to the New Testament, it's clarified for us. And so what are we told here? That the dragon, 
is the old serpent. Well, what do you think the Bible's talking about when he talks about the serpent? He's talking about the snake in the garden, the one that manifested himself and deceived Eve and, and brought the human race under sin. And he says, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. So what we see here is, is that this is what the Bible's saying, that one day this serpent, this dragon, the devil, also known as Satan the adversary, will be bound for a thousand years. All right, 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 all right. I want to talk to you about deception, deception of the nations. I want to talk to you about this for a second, and guess what? There's going to even be something in it for your individual life here in a moment, okay? So what I want you to see here is regarding deception of the uh, nations is this. Look, this is another Greek word. That word right there, if you were going to pronounce that in Greek, is ethnos. It's epsilon, theta, nu. I know it looks like a V, but it sounds like an N. Omicron Sigma, ethnos. Now, I'll put the rest of the word there because I didn't want to take up all the time doing it one letter at a time. So if we're going to fill in the blank, E, T-H, because that's the sound of theta, T-H, N, new, ethnicities. He deceived the nations. He deceived the ethnicities. Now, listen, there's a bigger part to this story that I'm trying to unfold for you. I'm trying to unfold the bigger picture of the whole world and all of the history that has gone before us and where we've been and where we're going. Because when we talk about ethnicities, we got to also remember what we've already been told in the book of Revelation, that every tongue, tribe, and nation. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 and in other places, Every tongue, tribe, and nation will be dressed in white robes. They will have palms in their hand, and they will be singing to the Lamb, and they will say, you redeemed us from the earth with your blood. So I'm just telling you right now, if you got a problem with my African-American sister, you got a problem. If you got a problem with, with uh, you know, Cajun speaking French folk, you got a problem. If you got a problem with Asian people, you got a problem because the word of God says you're going to be worshiping with them and living with all, all sorts of tribes, tongues, and nations. Racism is from the devil, my friend. I don't need no generation to tell me I need to get woke. The Lord woke me up one day when I got saved, and one day when the Lord broke the bondage of sin off of my heart and my life, I was woke all of a sudden, and I realized my wicked, evil heart had been lying to me and telling me things that that wasn't right, that I had received from my father before me. So I'm here to tell you every tongue, tribe, and nation. Now, but what I want you to see, I want to take it a little bit deeper. We're going a little bit deeper because we're talking about deception of the nations. So the next thing I want you to see is Babel. See there, Babel. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right, when I say Babel. Some of y'all don't know, but the story of the Tower of Babel. Mankind came together in a distinct rebellion against God. Now, there's a whole lot that I could talk to you about Babel. I'm not going to go there right now. What I need you to know, though, is that the story of the Tower of Babel is that mankind re rebelled against God. God had told man after the flood to multiply over the face of the earth because God always wanted his family to be made up of every tongue, tribe, and nation. But instead, they refused, and they disobeyed God, and they came together. And they said, we're going to build our own city, God, and we don't really need you to tell us what to do. And, you know, there's still human beings today. We're a lot of human beings. The world today is saying, no, we're really going to live our own lives the way that we want to, and we don't really need you involved, and we don't really want to hear what you have to say about that. We, we wanted, you gave us the free will. They don't, if they even acknowledge God, no, you gave me a free will, and I make my own decisions, and I don't need you to help me with this. So, but when we talk about the Tower of Babel, when God saw that, what did he do? He confused their languages. I don't even have time to tell you about research articles that I've read that can prove that the whole world was at one time truly under one language and one tongue. Nevertheless, God confused the languages and forced the people groups to spread out over the earth. Many of you have already heard all of these things. But when we get back to it, look, I want you to see this. The prince of Grecia the prince of Persia, right? So what, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that, that, that the deception of the ethnicities, 
the deception of the nations. He will, he will, he's going to be locked up for a thousand years, and he won't be able to deceive the nations for a whole thousand years. So what that's telling me is that right now today, as you and I are talking, he's deceiving the nations. He's still deceiving the nations. And how does he do such a thing? Daniel tells us that there's a prince of Persia. This might be a little too deep for some of y'all, but it just is what it is. It's the Bible. Prince of Persia, Prince of Grecia are fallen angels that, that the Bible tells us ha, ha, hold control over nations on the earth. Listen, there's a New Testament word for that. You can't read it because it's in Greek, but it's cosmo crater. The word cosmo crater comes out of Ephesians chapter 6. I'm about to make this more real for you here in just a second. Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. The world forces. If you click on that word right there in the Strongs, if you did, then what you would would see right there is that it would say world rulers. That's what it's talking about, world rulers. See, the nations are under the influence of fallen entities that are deceiving the masses and there's human beings listen to me my friend you why you still watch fox news <laughs> i'm not trying to make fun of you if you do but if you still watch fox news and you see all that little puppet show played out on the tv and all this stuff going on oh look at this look at that look at that. all these human beings that are doing all this deception you can't even believe nothing that they say there's a reason that all this stuff is going on anyway let me not get too deep into that. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that there's deception at the national level. There's deception at the world level. But I got to tell you, there's deception at the individual level. I already taught this when we first started the end time stories. I talked to you about geographical spiritual warfare. I talked to you about various places on the earth where there's hotbeds of demonic activity. But I got to tell you that just as there are geographical locations that have more demonic activity, so also you and I, if we're not careful, can invite demonic activity into our life. We've known that for a long time in the church. I mean, we're not, we, it's not like this is some kind of new information. We talk to you about that all the time, you, you, about not opening up doors and opening up doors and the foot and Satan ga- grabbing a foothold and how the enemy will begin to inflict demonic damage on Christian, on Christian people. We, we know that. We've seen demonic activity influence Christian believers. Have you not, have you not experienced it your own self? If we're honest with one another, how many people have experienced it their own selves? Amen. But I got to tell you that there's good news tonight. So why do you, why do sometimes we keep doing the same thing that we find ourselves doing, falling into the same old trap that we find ourselves falling into? Because many times we're not free in our heart and in our lives. But I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus came to this earth to set the captive free. That's what God did when he sent Jesus to die on the cross. Listen, not just to get you into heaven. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm just going to go ahead and go to the scripture. Colossians chapter 2. Let's go ahead and go there real quick. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. And we're going to go ahead and go into the King James Version. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What is he talking about? He's talking about the law. See, the law, you can't live according to the law, my friend. You can try to live by a bunch of rules and regulations. You can try to clean yourself up on the outside. And you can try to go through the, the, the works of Christianity. And listen, you can even try to speak Christianese. You can sit in a church for 15 years, and you say, hey, brother, hey, sister, how you doing? You coming to the family gathering next week? Are the kids going to the little campy thing? Oh, every, everything's going good with you, and you paste your little fake smile on your face, but if you ain't got Jesus really living on the inside of your heart, and you're really not born again, and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're, you're bait for the enemy. You cannot live according to a set of rules and regulations. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way. And look at this. He nailed it to his cross. This is the part I want you to see. He spoiled principalities and powers. He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What this tells me is that Jesus didn't just die 
to get you to heaven. Jesus died so that you could have freedom from the bondage of the forces of evil. I, I, let me just say that again. Jesus died so that you and I could have freedom from the forces of evil. If we're honest with one another, though, sometimes we do. We need a spiritual breakthrough. Amen. We need a spiritual breakthrough in our heart and in our lives. Because you know what the real problem is? is that many times our flesh does not want to succumb to the will of the Lord. Come on. Right, the enemy is still trying to draw and hold on to our flesh. Right? And he's trying to say, oh, you know how good this makes you feel. You know how much you like that way that smells. You know you love the taste of this. You know you want some more of that. And our flesh is being stimulated by demonic activity. And we just like a little horse with a carrot in front of our nose running over there like the ox, ox that's led to the slaughter till he's pierced through with his liver. Sin slowly erodes and destroys the heart and the life of man. And the more fish line you get, the enemy's just like feeding you, right? I mean, I've seen that. He's just feeding you. Oh, I found the right bait right now, baby. I'm like a fly fisherman. Let me just go ahead and give it to him. Let me, let me lead him. Let me lead him. I got him just right where I want him. Pop! Then he pulls the hook, and look, he thinks he got you. But look, the, he ain't got nothing. You hear me? He ain't got nothing. Jesus has the victory, amen? I'm here to tell you Jesus has the victory. Jesus said that I have given you authority to trample on scorpions and demons. Jesus is the answer. Jesus. And what he did for you at the cross. What does that even mean, preacher? I don't even understand that. Well, guess what? You stick around long enough. You hold on to Jesus long enough. And I'm telling you, you will gain revelation from the Lord. And he will enter into your heart. And he will begin to cleanse your mind. And he will begin to make you whole. Amen. He will begin to. Listen, this is what we come here to preach. We come here to preach Jesus. We come here to preach Jesus and his finished work and to tell you that you can put your hope and your faith because he is an anchor beyond the veil. And if you tie yourself to the anchor, no matter how bad the storms of life may be, no matter how bad it looks, the Lord will set you free if you will hold on to him. Amen. But listen, you can't just keep running out there and keep drinking it. What are you talking about? You're coming to get, I ain't even talking about alcohol right now. I'm just saying you can't just keep running out there and drinking whatever you're drinking. Let's call it a bottle of XXX, sin. Whatever it looks like, whatever it is. Whatever. You can't just keep drinking it and think you're going to go unscathed. I'm going to go unscathed. Amen? We need the help of the Lord to give us victory. So listen, I'm just trying to talk to you about deception over the nations. And I need you to also understand that the enemy of your soul, he wants to deceive you. He wants to deceive you. He wants to pull you away from the Lord. He wants to, look, he'll find any kind of way he can. I don't care how good it looks. He'll paint it. He'll make it look pretty. He'll try to, he'll try to convince you that it's something good and it's something spiritual. And it could be, and it can have a lot of truth. I'm talking about churches now. I'm talking about churches and doctrine and, 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 and the way people teach. And, and it can have so much truth in it. But then it, at the same time, it has untruth. It has half-truth. It has falsities. And it leads you down a road where you put your faith in something other than Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants you and I free. Amen. And he sent Jesus to set us free. So he's going to cast him into this bottomless pit. And he sets a seal upon him. Let me go ahead and go back to the NASB. Threw him into the abyss, sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. You know, let's, we're going to talk about that in a second. But I want you to think about that just for a second. I mean, well, why? Why would the Lord have to release? Like, why, when is he going to wrap this thing up? You know what I'm saying? Like, why? So you're going to put him in a pit for a thousand years and then you're going to release him? Why? I mean, why don't you just keep him in prison? Give him a life sentence. Like, let's just be done with this joker, right? But there's a reason. There, there's always a reason. When you read something, there has to be a reason behind it, right? So then he said, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given to them. Now, real quick, I want you to see. I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna to transition and go to another verse of scripture, but I want you to because I want you to see something. Because we're talking about the whole of the biblical story when we talk about the whole story of God. And I want you to see something that I felt like the Lord showed me a long time ago. So he says, after Satan was thrown into the bottomless pit, he said, I saw, who's he? John. John the, John the one that wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the book of Revelation. Where did he write this book? 
on a prison island called Patmos. He was imprisoned under Emperor Domitian uh, for preaching the gospel. He was on a, he was on a, a, a prison island, and he got this vision. All right, And he says, then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. We're going to get into that in a second, but I want to take you to this scripture real quick out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 through 7. You know, a lot of times in our walk with God, we can't even get along with other Christians, right? Listen, I got to tell you, I know good and well, and I say this, I say this with all love, you know, look, I, I promise you, if I get on your nerves, I don't want to get on your nerves. I really don't want to be an irritating person, but I know that sometimes I can be. All right, but can I tell you something? There's a whole lot of other people out there that's irritating if we're just real with one another. And unfortunately, many times Christians can be very, very irritating. As a matter of fact, a lot of Christians think they know everything. And I've been accused of that too. Oh, you think you know everything. All right, I'll admit it, you know, sometimes I feel like I got some answers, but I'm just going to have to learn how to just keep my mouth shut because maybe I just don't know everything, and and maybe people just don't even really want to hear that much about what I got to say. But look, sometimes people got, got, they got this, this, it's like a control spirit. It's like a spirit of superiority over them and they walk around and they and they think that they have all the answers to life and you know and there and a lot of times it's you know what you know when, when it really happens and some of y'all I see some of y'all shaking y'all's head and the reason some of y'all shaking y'all's head because y'all probably like say y'all probably saying been there done that y'all y'all should be saying been there done that because any of us that have been in the faith for any length of time and once we start to be do, doing kind of okay spiritually do we not become that person for a period of time where we think that we know everything and that we're superior to everyone else and that everybody needs to sit at our feet and to learn and we have so much to teach them and then at some point in time the Lord rebukes our heart with that very thing and shows us how self-righteous we were and how we thought we knew everything and how disgusting that in and of itself was. Oh, you just traded your spirit of lust for a spirit of, of control, for a spirit of Jezebel, for a spirit of you got all the answers. No, that, that's just, his, that's self-righteous Righteousness, that's garbage. The Lord doesn't want to have any, and nobody can receive from that. So look, he's going to say, look, do you, do, do, right here, and what I was trying to say is, is that sometimes believers can't even get along with one another. Right? But we can't even get along with one another. I mean, how in the world are we supposed to have the book of Acts whenever we can't get along with one another? Oh, this group over here thinks this. This group over there thinks that. That group over there thinks this. And look, he said this and she said that, and I don't believe what this one believes. We need to come together, and what we need to be able to unify on, this is an iPad, but I don't have a Bible up here anymore. But look, what we need to be able to unify is on the Word of God. The Apostle Paul said, I would that we'd speak the same thing. God's word, it, listen, we ought to be work, workers rightly dividing the word of truth so that we need not be ashamed. We got to put the time in, my friend, dissect the word and make sure we got the truth. We can't just be going running after anything that sounds good and sounds hyper spiritual or whatever the case. But look, he, he said, look at what he says. We're talking about thrones right now. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, I don't know if you ever saw that before. Okay, you want another version? Let me give you this, the King James. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? <laughs> and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? That means that you and I as believers, we have an unction or an anointing from the Holy One. That's 1 John 2, 20. And you should know all truth that when you mix the Holy Spirit with the Word of God, the Lord begins to give you the eyes and the mind of Jesus and you begin to see the world a whole lot different. And the Lord's saying, can you not at least even judge small things? Look at this. Know ye not that you shall judge angels? <laughs> Do you, did you know that you're going to judge angels? Now, how does that look? And then he wants to know how much more things that pertain to this life. He's like, look, could you just try to get your business right down here for a little bit? Because, look, one day I'm going to put you on the throne and you're going to judge angels. Now, why do you propose that God would have believers judging angels? Because angels have rebelled against the will of God. How it goes down, how exactly it looks, I don't really know. But I imagine in my mind it looks something like this. The thrones are set up, the saints sit on the throne, and there's a court session, and 
the fallen angels have to give an account for what they did because they're about to be judged. They're about to be thrown into, because we haven't even got there yet, but Satan's about to end up in the lake of fire. And they're all going to end up in the lake of fire. And for, I'm not even saying that we're even going to open our mouth, my friend. I just would imagine that we'll be sitting right there and, he, and, and, and these fallen angels are going to be despisingly looking at us because they think that we're a bunch of weak little mortal creatures to begin with and they hate us and their fangs are dripping blood and they want to eat you alive. Oh, if you saw them right now, if the Lord pulled back, the, it's real, my friend. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it's real. And thank God he doesn't let us see it because we'd be all having a panic attack. I mean, by the grace of God, I don't know if I've ever had a panic attack, but I'm telling you right now, if the grace of the Lord wasn't with us and he gave us a glimpse into the spiritual realm, right now we'd all be having a major physiological problem, probably many, okay, because it's real. And if the, thank God that the Lord gives us, gives us some, some help. <laughs> Amen. But, but this is what I imagine. Here's the thrones. Here's the saints. And here's these fallen angels that saw God in all of his glory. Can you imagine that? These angels saw God in all of his glory, and yet they still rebelled against God. Does that make us any better? Because, listen, we've receive the grace. If, if you're born again tonight, if you're not born again, I highly suggest you, do you look into that. Amen. I highly suggest you invite Jesus into your heart. I highly suggest you search your heart and ask the Lord to save you. Amen. That you invite Jesus in and you just let him know, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I want you. Amen. You can come up here right now. As a matter of fact, if, if you ain't got to come up here right now, but that'd be a good time to come up. Just run up here. We'll shut the whole service down. We'll start praying with you. But guess what? I highly recommend that you do business with the Lord and that you invite Jesus into your heart. Oh, but I got to clean myself up and I got to throw this away. No, 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 no. Just start off with just inviting Jesus into your heart. Tell him you want him. Let him plant a seed of the gospel on the inside of you and let him begin to do the work. Anyway, here's all these believers they never saw me in all of my glory. They heard a story that I was real, the story that came from other people. They chose to believe, and when they believed, my spirit went on the inside of them. And yeah, they went through toil and trial and tribulation, but in the end, they held on to me through faith. And guess what? Now, one day, I'm just wanting you to know you're going to be used by God to judge angels. Whether you open your mouth, I doubt it. I don't think you're going to be railing on no fallen angel. The Lord, be, slow your roll. We don't want to talk about all your mess, right? But anyway, I'm just trying to make a point that there's thrones. Thrones that are going on here, and uh, I wanted you to see that. I wanted uh, to mention that to you right there. All right, so he says right here that, um, that, there, that these, that the, uh, they came, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself here. Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony. And let me go back to my little, my little thing here, and uh, that was the word cosmo crater. Oh, yeah, I, I want, no, this is a good point. I, so I was about to pass this up. So that word cosmo crater, you remember whenever I told you all about that world ruler? That, th this is a compound word in the Greek. The first part of it is cosmo or cosmic, okay? And then the second word means to seize. Now, this goes along with some of what I was saying before. See, those world rulers are like big-time fallen angels that are, that are ruling over nations. And essentially, what the whole plan of darkness is, check it out, is to try to seize what belongs to God away from him. Have y'all been watching on TV this new deal that's going on where somebody just walks up to the courthouse and they say, oh, look, 525, whatever your address is, 525 da 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 street. Look, it's notarized by the notar notary. This is my house right here. Oh, sure thing, sir. We'll file that away for you right now. And the next thing you know, you don't even own your house. Y'all heard about that? Oh, yeah. People like coming up with these titles and they're getting it notarized. And I mean, at least that's what they're saying on title lock on the, on the commercial. They just walk up there and they'll tell you the whole blurb on there. I know they're trying to sell us something, but they'll say, we can't stop it. If they come up here with a notarized paper, boom, now you don't even own your house anymore. So, I, I, no, I know that's a lie. The devil's a liar, right? No, but I'm telling you, they say that that happened. you imagine how frustrated you feel? Works of Satan are trying to seize the things that belong to God. Trying to steal his property. Trying to steal his geography. 
trying to steal his people. And look, how does it affect us? Just like what I was talking to you earlier. I don't have to start all over again, but just as there's entities that are trying to move on big swaths of land, there's enemies that are trying to move on you because you are now God's geography. If you have given your heart to the Lord, you know, I used to share with this girl one time that was a nurse practitioner, and uh, we worked together side by side, and she was like really the sweetest. Th- I swear, like, you know, you could say, man, you know, I don't know what this family did when they raised this, this woman. I mean, she's just like such a, she's so kind, and she's so like so put together, like her brain and her personality and her compassion and her kindness and she don't even know Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, for a second there, you know, it's like he starts to get confusing. I mean, she's so sweet. She ought to just be able to work her way right into heaven. And then I started saying, that's a lie. <laughs> and so I started sharing the gospel with her. But it's kind of like whenever you got somebody that's really, like, doesn't, can't see where they're wrong. You know what I'm saying? I mean, all of her bills are paid. She's got money in the bank. Her husband owns all these apartments and homes. She drives nice cars. They buy a new Rolex every year, but she's not even snobby. She does Everything seems to be perfectly fine. And I'm like, yeah, but if you're just only in religion and you don't have Jesus in your heart, you know. And, and then she starts opening up, and she starts to mention how some things happened to her when she was a little girl. And I'm like, and, and she hurts from that, you see. And I'm like, I'm here to tell you i'm here to tell you that the lord can heal you the lord wants to to touch you and so i start to try to talk to her about inviting the lord into her heart and things like that and you know i would even write down prayers for her for her to pray and one day you know i said well hey did you did you pray that prayer I, we prayed before we ate <laughs> i said no no you're not getting it you're not getting what, what I'm trying to say. It's not you're saying grace before you cut your steak. Did you invite Jesus into your heart? Did, did, you, ask him to, did you ask him to forgive you of your sin? Did you, did you invite him to come in? Because if you do and you call on the name of Jesus, and then a miracle can happen on the inside of you, and you can be saved, and the Lord will move in, and your life will never be the same in a good way. How does this affect me? It affects me in a big way because the enemy is trying to steal my piece of geography from the Lord too. You see, because the point I was trying to make with all that is this. When you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart, guess what? You become the possession of the Lord. You become the property of God. His spirit now lives on the inside of you. And if you think the devil's okay with that, my friend, I can tell you right now, he is not okay with that, not even a little bit. And he's going to try to fight you tooth and nail to keep you from going back towards the Lord. This little scripture right here, what we got in verse 5, it says that the rest of those people aren't going to awake until the end of the thousand years. Those who received the mark. I put this, it just comes out of verse 5, but I'm the one that, that wrote it. It's not really the, it's not the Bible, but they, I put it like this. They agreed to terms with Satan. They agreed to serve him and become part of his kingdom. You know, I oftentimes think, you know, and we've gone through a whole process in the book of Revelation and breaking down, you know, Aaron has preached a couple of the Wednesday night services, and I know that I have really tried to pound it home, and the reason that I did the way that I did it was is because I am concerned that where I'm seeing the rapture taking place is in a different place than what we were always taught. And what I tried to explain to everyone whenever I was teaching it was that I wasn't trying to do something to irritate people and to, like, you know, pro- prod, prod the, like, you know, the Lord told Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? It's because what I envision in my mind is this grand scheme of deception that if it doesn't go down the way people thought it was going to go down, it's the last, it's the last, it's checkmate, bam. And it's bad, dude. It's so bad because nobody was prepared for it. And you're slowly lulled into it. You know what I'm saying? Like you've been slowly lulled into it. Let me me give you an example. And I don't really care anymore that we're online. I'm not trying to cause trouble and get kicked off or any of that kind of stuff. I don't think the shot is the mark of the beast. Let me just say that. I don't think that. I don't. Okay? And a lot of reasons why. But do I think that they've been using that shot to manipulate people? (laughs) To tell you that you got to do this and you got to do that and put pressure down on people? And since when, as an American citizen, have to be told absolutely what they want to do for the betterment of the globe? And so what I'm trying to say is, is that they're trying to push it 
they pushing and they pushing and they wearing you down and they're wearing you down and they like, and they're trying to get us to give in. And, and, and as soon as they get us to give in and to become a little bit weak in the knees, the next thing you know, they'll come around the corner with something new, monkey pox or something. Oh, now we got to give you a new kind of shot. I don't even know. I mean, I don't think that monkey pox is that big of a deal, but I'm just trying to make a point. Be about right, though. We got to give you a shot that's got some live monkey DNA in it now. We got a new mRNA technology, and we can, like, put some monkey stuff up in you. And that's like real close to you anyway, so now you're going to be like a little bit of a piece of a monkey. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just making stuff up, but I'm trying to make a point that it's a slow process to wear the people down, wear them down, wear them down to the point where they like, life can go back to normal for you. All you have to do is blah, 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 blah. How many, do people, how many people want their normal life back? Man, I just want to go to work, dude. I've been working since I was 12 years old, man. I just want to go to work. I want to be able to put some gas in my truck. Look, Rob called me up. He said he got a roof for me tomorrow. I want to go to work. Okay, I, I, I get it. But look, this life is temporary, my friend. We started this whole thing off to say this life is nothing but a vapor. And if you and I are living for our paycheck tomorrow or we're living for our, the next stock we're going to buy, we're going to hit the big one or whatever the case, we're missing it, my friend. Can you go to work tomorrow? You better. Can you buy stock? I, I advise it personally until financial Babylon corrupts and then everybody's not going to have anything. But my point being is this, is that if that's what you're living your life for, if that's the focal point of your life, we're going to be sad. It's going to be a sad day, all right? So, but some people are going to, they're going to receive the mark. They're going to agree to terms with Satan. They're going to become part of his kingdom. You see that? There's, a, there's two kingdoms on the earth, and God sent his son Jesus to invite you and I to come to the wedding, to be part of it, to be married to the bridegroom, to be married to Jesus. That might sound weird to you if you're, if you're a man, but it's not weird like that. Jesus it's a long story, the Jewish wedding, we're not going to get into it, but Jesus paid a price. See, the Jewish bridegroom, the Jewish groom would pay a price for his bride. Jesus paid a price, amen? He paid with his precious blood. He purchased you, amen? And all you got to do is receive him, and then you'll be his. So they will wake up, and they will be judged, all right? Um, Now, the other people, let's go back and let's look at this a little bit. So let's look at this. Uh, So he's going to be thrown into the abyss. It's going to be sealed. He's going to stay there for the thousand years. And look what it says. Then I saw the thrones. Judgment was given to them. And the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life. And reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, the Bible teaches that there's going to be a rapture. This is, I believe, at the end of the seven-year period. But whenever the rapture takes place, the word rapture is synonymous with resurrection. The dead in Christ. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. And there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Amen. So those that don't receive the mark, see, some of these people, I believe the rapture is already taking place. Some of those people are still going to die because they refuse the mark, even though they may miss the rapture. And they're having to go through horrible, the last part of the tribu- uh, tribulation or the last part of the wrath of God going on. And they're, and, and they're going to refuse to receive the mark because they're going to realize. Now, let me tell you how they're going to realize. Look at this. They were beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and what else? Because of the word of God. Think about that. I never even really noticed that before. I know I'm going long already, huh? We've got about five till eight. I'm going to try to shut it down. I'll never finish the whole thing. But look, because of the word of God. Do you know that if Satan could erase this book from the earth, he would have done it a long time ago? Oh, he tries to pervert it. He tries to corrupt it. But look, this word right here, if we wouldn't have this word, Listen to me. Listen to me, Christian. You, you need to be reading this word. We are so fat and sassy. I was watching a video the other day of some, uh, I don't even, oh, no, it was a, it was a who, did, who showed me that video? 
I can't remember who showed it. Was that you that showed me that video of that girl that was dressed up like she was from the Middle East or something? She was going back and forth. And she was saying, her, she was, it was herself. And in one scene, she's like all dressed up. And she's all like, girl, we, we do all of these little things at the church. We have our little coffee get-togethers. And, you know, and, the other, and then she got her face. She, they, she turns the camera to herself. And she like got dirt all over her face. And she, she's like, oh, y- y'all have a Bible? She's like, we have to hide little pages and pieces of it. And, and she said, you know, we have to memorize it and we got to keep it in our heart because, like, because if we get caught with it, we'll go to prison. And the other girl's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Of course we got a Bible that's sitting on it, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, y- y'all must read it all the time. Y'all must, oh, what a beautiful life that must be to be able to have a Bible. And, you know, she was, it was a satire and she was playing both sides of the story. But the point that she was trying to make is, is that most believers really and truly if we're honest with one another, we're not really studying the Bible like we're supposed to. And there's people in other countries that would die to be able to have the word of God. I'm not trying to make nobody feel weird. I'm just telling you the truth. We fat and sassy in America, man. We done got so spoiled. And, and Lord, help us. Cause, but look at this. And because of the word of God, they refused to take the mark of the beast. They refused to sign up for Satan's kingdom. And instead, they were beheaded. Whoever they are, they chose the guillotine over the mark that would allow them to buy food for their baby. They chose instead to be beheaded. Why? Because the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord told them that this was just a temporary vapor of life. The word of the Lord told them that if they received Christ, that they would also receive eternal life. The word of the Lord told them that there was something else to live for and they had the word of the Lord and they had it in their heart and they knew that the right thing was not to take that mark and instead to go to the extreme of allowing them to cut their head off. That's some heavy-duty stuff. Are y'all going to be able to sleep tonight? I hope you can sleep. Lord, give them peaceful rest. I believe, listen, let me tell you something. I don't care how bad it is, how bad it looks. If you're in the will of the Lord, the Lord will give you peace. You'll rest like a baby. Amen? I believe you're going to rest like a baby tonight. Praise God. And I believe that he'll give you sweet dreams. Praise God. Or if it's not a sweet dream, it'll be for a purpose. Share it with us. He might give you something, some wisdom in a dream. Amen. So they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead did not come to life again until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. I remember Brad Bullock saying one time, my old pastor, he said, look, dude, if you, if you, and I mean, he would say it funny and everybody always thought it was funny. It's really not funny. It's sad. But I mean, he would try to make it lighter, you know, after I'm so harsh, you know, he'd say, dude, if you wake up after the thousand years and you see a white throne, close your eyes and play possum, go back to sleep. You don't want to be there. You know, he said it a lot funnier than me, but anyway, because that means the great white throne judgment is where those people whose names you know, the great white throne judgment is where those people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, if your name's not in the book of life, you're going, you ain't waking up till that thousand-year millennial reign is over. And when you wake up after that thousand-year millennial reign, when they check them books, your book ain't in the book of life, you're going, you're going to be judged. You're going to the same place as Satan and his other fallen angels and the false prophet and the Antichrist. And listen, don't let the devil lie to you and tell you, oh, preacher, but, but, but I messed up yesterday. Listen, you're either saved or you're not. Christians, Christians mess up too. Christ, now, I'm not trying to tell you that it's okay for us to keep living a life of failure. That's not God's will for our life. Amen? But I am trying to tell you that we're not trying to talk about perfection. We're trying to talk about do you have the perfect one living on the inside of you? Amen? All right. So this is the first, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection, talking about the rapture, talking about being raised from the dead in Christ. Over these, the second death has no power. That's another thing Brad used to say that was so clever and witty. He would say, you're either going to be born twice or die twice. What are you talking about? Well, you're either going to be born physically of your mother and then be born again, or you're going to die twice. You're going to die physical death, and you're going to die at the great white throne judgment. Be choose born two births or two deaths. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, again, why? Why are you releasing him, Lord? 
I mean, I know some of y'all have already thought about this. And he will come to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. I really promise you I'm not going to keep you a lot longer, okay? But I want to ask you a question. Y'all had some people talking to y'all about that whole flat earth thing lately? Anybody approached y'all yet about that whole flat earth thing? Huh? I mean, we're over here laughing, making fun. Y'all probably know some flat earth people. I ain't trying to clown nobody flat. that's flat earth. I just don't get it, dude. Like, I come up with some stuff. Y'all know me. I come up with some stuff, man. I mean, like, I'm talking to y'all about Jack Whiteside Parsons where Marvel comic books came from to practice some kind of crazy magic and NASA came out of his living room. I done told y'all about that, but that's legit stuff, dude. You can find it. Go ahead, Google it right now and read about it later. Jack Parsons. Do it. I dare you. But look, they say, look, the Bible says there's four corners on the earth. So now the, the earth's flat because there's four corners. Okay, number one, King James Version also says don't shave your beard at the corners. Don't, don't round your head at the corners. I mean, your head's not flat. My point is, is that what is the purpose? Why would they be trying to deceive us into believing that the earth is round? What kind of a conspiracy theory? I had a conversation with somebody recently. And I'm like, just tell me the purpose, sis. Come on. Give, it, give me the punchline. What's the reason that they're deceiving us and telling us that the earth is round? And she said, because NASA and all, I said, I get that, NASA, that's right, let me tell you, Jack Whiteside Parsons, the whole thing, the Lima occult magic, deception, aliens are not aliens, they're really fallen angels, and all of this other stuff, I get that, but why? Why do they want me to think the earth's round? What is that going to do to me? How is that going to shake my faith? Okay, and when you get that answer, then you come back and talk to me, and I know I'm being facetious, but I promise you, if you hit me with a zinger and it makes sense, I'm going to be real quiet and I'm going to start listening, all right? And I will give you time. She even said it. She said, thank you for listening to me. Anytime, sister. I will listen to you, my friend. Hopefully you're not watching the video and she knows what I'm talking about. All right. From the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So I want to give you real quick just a couple of more thoughts before we close. But I want you to think about this. This is after Satan is released for a short period of time and the purpose is to deceive the nation. All right, and it says that the number of them, the number of them, you can't even count it. I was going to bring you to Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9. So, I mean, if you happen to, you know, if you want to take some notes and you want to go look at it later, I don't feel like we really have time to go to Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9. But let me just tell you what, what that passage of Scripture in the Old Testament talks about. It talks about the millennial reign of Christ. What it's talking about is what it's going to look like during that time frame. And it says that a wolf and a lamb will lie together. Can you imagine a wolf and a lamb? A, a wolf just snuggling, sticking his head up in that lamb, that little lamb's neck, you know, how comfy that is. A little wool pillow. Aw. Probably licks his face. Loves his little lamb, right? And, and the lion's going to eat grass. And a child could literally go and put his hand on an adder or a snake's hole. Because the glory of the Lord is going to fill the air. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, Robert told me a while, whenever I first met Robert, he told me, he said, dude, the Lord told me to flee the city. And I was like, he said, I didn't even know what that meant. Flee the city. And he said, then one day I was driving on the interstate and I was moving back towards, I was heading towards Houston. And I remember this before he even said it, because I remember when I went to go visit my sister in Austin, I was like, oh, Lord, all them strip club billboards. <laughs> Like they're beckoning you, right? The point that I'm trying to make is, is that sin is so prevalent, right? I mean, you, I, I don't know how you accidentally get on a porn site because, I mean, I, I understand it can happen. I rec highly recommend you don't. But I'm just saying, people, we say that. Those of us that have accidentally been on porn sites many, many years ago say we accidentally got on a porn site. Okay, so we accidentally clicked the button. But I will tell you this, if you accidentally get on a porn site, it's a whole lot easier to accidentally get in it than to purposefully get out of it. It's like this crazy web. It's like you start pressing buttons and like all of a sudden there's a virus. It's like, oh my God, all right, get out of here. And it's like the next thing you know, you're like knee deep and all. That, what I'm trying to say is, is that that ain't a lamb laying with a wolf. 
that ain't a, a, a lion eating grass, and that sure enough ain't no child putting their hand on a snake's hole and not getting bit. What I'm trying to say is that's the prevalent spirit in the air. What, I, what I'm saying is sin is prevalent, and the enemy has power over the hu human beings because of the spirit of Antichrist and all of these things that are going on. But listen, during that millennial reign, that's 1,000 years. And there's going to be people that aren't going to have glorified bodies. But during that 1,000 years, it's going to be like flip-flopped, right? I mean, is that not what you get if a, if, a, if a wolf and a lamb can lie together? It's going to be flip-flopped. You're going to have billboards of strippers all over the place. Yeah, I don't know what it's going to be if there are billboards, but it ain't going to be that. I can tell you that, right? Come to a revival, the Apostle Paul in his glorified body is going to be preaching Romans chapter 6. What? I'm, I'm down for that, bro. <laughs> what? All right. So, but what I'm trying to say is it's going to be different. But yet, even after a thousand years, whenever that liar is released for a short period of time, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore that are going to try to come against Christ and his kingdom. I, I'm thinking to myself, y'all had that stuff in y'all the whole time? <laughs> Y'all was just faking it till you make it? How y'all stayed that wicked during that whole thousand years? I'm not trying to act like I'm holy and I've arrived. That's not what I'm saying. I just don't get it. And then this many people are going to try to revolt and rebel against God? I don't, I don't understand it. All right. And so they come against the camp of the saints, and the Lord deceives them. I mean, he, the Lord uh, destroys them with fire. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Isn't that good news? I, got I don't want to end on bad news. I'm about to shut it down, I promise. But look, the, the devil ends up in the lake of fire and the, where the beast, which is the Antichrist, and the false prophet are also with him. And look, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then there's judgment, the great white throne judgment. I saw the dead, the great, and the small. This is the part I want you to see. Look at this. The small standing before the throne and the books. I thought this was interesting because I had a conversation with Wade the other day. Wade, I'm going to just share your testimony, brother, because if it's okay, if I, if I can say a little bit of it, is that okay? So Wade had a, uh, not a vision. It was a real thing that happened to him. And um, it was some, he saw angels, like, and he was like in a state, like a spiritual state where he couldn't move. He shared it with us at the little meeting the other night. But the main point I wanted to make was, was that the angel was, he said all he could do was move his eyes this way and this way, and he could see these angels. And he said he described the beauty of them. He could count the golden hairs on the angel's head. And, I mean, I know Wade, he ain't, like, just talking trash like that. I know that this was legit, so I was listening. And so, but, he, but this is what got me almost more than anything. He said, Matt, there's books. And he said there's another spot in the book of Revelation. We just happened to be coming to this, and he had shared this story with me. He didn't know we were going to be here. And he said all he could hear, he said as fast as the thoughts were in his mind, that angel was, was writing in the book. It was like <laughs> writing like just so fast. And um and and so he and he, and then you said this and I never even got to say. He said, I'm just telling you we're being watched. Dude, that blew me away later after I hung up the phone because the Bible talks about watcher angels. Even in the book of Daniel it says a watcher, a holy one. And so and and now he made it clear. He said, I'm not trying to say that we're going to be judged if our names in the book of life but people are going to be judged on their actions in these books. He said, not one book, many books. Look what it says. It says, and I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And by the way, the, the Daniel passage, if you want to go back and look, is Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. It talks about the books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So all them little, all them deeds, if you ain't in Christ, my friend, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and your name's not written in the book of life, there's a whole bunch of other books being written. I remember one time I was at a men's meeting and that guy said, the Lord got a video on you. He's seen everything you did last night. Boy, like everybody was like cringing, man. It's like, wait, hold on a second, bro. Like, that ain't going to fly. That might work for a week, dude, but next week I'll be back sinning again. But look, but the book of life, my name's in the book of life. I've been, my sin's been judged on Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank God, because you don't want to see my book, my friend. I don't want to see yours no more than you want to see mine. Mike's like, oh, no, I want to see it. And you know you don't, Mike. Don't let us look at your book, bro. <laughs> 
Amen. Books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And look at this. This is where I'm closing, right here. See how it's all in purple. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would begin to move on the hearts of your people, Lord. Anybody that might watch this video, anybody that might be sitting in this sanctuary that has never received you as their Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything other than Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Holy Spirit, I pray that you begin to deal with each and every one of our hearts. Lord, I pray that those that may watch or might be in this place that have never received you, that they would say it right now, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Lord, please forgive me. I know I'm a sinner, but I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sin. Would you please come into my heart? Say it right now, Christian. Say it right now, my friend. You, got, you invite him in. Say it. Say, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Teach me your ways. Fill me with your spirit. The Bible says that if you would repent and that you would call on the name of Jesus, that his spirit would come to live on the inside of you. I'm telling you right now, it won't make you perfect, but you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same, and your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life and the angels of heaven. The Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, the Bible says that when one man, sinner gets saved, that the angels begin to sing. The angels sing a song of the redeemed. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would receive this Jesus that we preach. Father, I pray for every heart that's been in here tonight, starting with mine. You see our lives, Lord God, right now, in the name of Jesus, the enemy would try to, the enemy would try to haunt our lives with, with the works of Satan and demonic oppression and demonic spirits and, 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 and demonic influence and try to cause us to, to move in a direction that he would have us to move. But in the name of Jesus, he is not our master. You are our master. And we renounce the works of Satan in the name of Jesus. We embrace you, O oh Lord God, and pray that you would begin to minister to every heart, that you would begin to break the chains of bondage, Lord God, in people's lives, Lord, the things that try to hold them fast the things that, that the enemy tries to use as a leash over them, whatever it may be, addiction, Lord God, and lust, and whatever the case, all of these demonic entities that try, to, that try to influence our lives and try to drive us in a direction other than your will, Lord God. We thank you for Calvary, Lord, and for the victory that you purchased for us, Lord God. We claim you as our Lord and Savior and ask you to do a deep work on the inside of our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.